here's the first discussion question for you all. What are the main considerations for a quantity surveyor when working to level two BIM? Uh, so who would like to start us off uh, with this one? Uh, Andrew. Hi, hi, thank you. Um, so first of all, I think you need to think about level one. Uh, we are still working to achieve a full compliance in this area, and it shouldn't be underestimated. And, and what it involves, I think it's put very quick to sort of focus on level two without even considering level one. So I think it's quite an important consideration. But obviously, to answer the question, I think you need to have an understanding of the documents that make up level two, how they interact with each other. But remember, you're employed as a QS and not necessarily the project lead. So it's important to act in the capacity for which you're engaged. I think you need to think about the information you need from the process based on the role that you're appointed on, the ability to extract quantities and provide cost updates to the client and client team is likely to be one of these roles. So what does this mean you need? These are the sort of things you need to be considering. You need to ensure that you feed the information into the, into the process early on. Too often the QS gets appointed after the design team and standards and processes are agreed. That does not help the BIM QS perform their role more, more efficiently. So if you're using NRM, make it clear what this means to the design team and how you want information presented and when. Hopefully you can agree on a common goal. Great. Does anyone else want to pick up on that question or should we move on? Uh, Robert. Yeah. I, I was just going to add to that, uh, um, and, and it's disappointing to hear Andrew's experience that, uh, um, that the QSs aren't brought into the loop um, uh, uh, before the design team and standards have been agreed at that, at that point. That's, that's not really level two BIM. Um, but uh, as, uh, as a QS, I think um, uh, it's what is important is that they... Um, are, take part in the uh, construction of the BIM execution plan and make it clear what their expectations are at the beginning of the project, just as the rest of the design team do. I think the QS is in an interesting situation um, compared to the rest of the design team in that they are probably the first person on a project who is exposed to information where they're reliant on other parties creating it, um, whereas a lot of the time with the design team there's more of a sort of melting pot in the first instance. Great, thank you. Um, let's move on to the next discussion point, um, which is, what are the key level two requirements you see as beneficial for any BIM project? Who would like to kick us off there? There we go. James Brown. Good morning, thank you. Um, it's a good, good question. I think when you look at uh, the number of documents that there are to, that make up sort of uh, level two through the uh, the PAS documents. I think you need to ask the question: um, beneficial to who? Is it beneficial to the client or beneficial to to the, su the supply chain? I think if you're looking from a client perspective, um, there are a lot of things that would be substantially beneficial to you in terms of the end use of the data. So things like Kobe, I think, are, are very beneficial to them. Not necessarily as beneficial there uh, to, to the supply chain, but I think on the supply chain side, the, the elements that are really beneficial uh, that will help reduce cost um, and errors on the project are things like the coordination, the collaboration, you know, how data is shared, and all of this will contribute to uh, increasing the project memory, so you're not getting the memory loss when data and information is handed from, from uh, one stage to the next. Thank you, James. Uh, anyone else want to pick up on that one? Or? Um, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in and just say, as James Cameron here, um, that the obviously it, level two is about a form of collaborative uh, working, and it's about uh, leading towards a federated model that can be interrogated, particularly by the QS. But um, increasingly, uh, and I speak from uh, from an architectural background, that for me, I'm finding that uh, data is becoming more important than possibly the geometry. And I know that's sometimes a contentious statement, but I think when you start to mature your understanding of, of BIM, it is about the information that is sitting behind it, not just the, um, the model itself. And that's where the level of maturity comes to, to the QSs and, and what they can add to the equation. Great stuff. Thank you, James. Um, next up... How does BIM help the quantity surveyor? Uh, I'll throw this over to Andrew. Hi. Okay, so as we've already seen, we can extract quantities very quickly. However, it's important to understand what design stage you're at, whether the designers have designed this stage, and if there are any additional or missing errors within the design. For example, if you measure the stillwork within the design, it may be that the structural engineer has not included any secondary stillwork, so you'd need to make the appropriate allowances. It should also be noted that the specification can be included within the objects, which helps group and sort the quantities as required. So again, that saves quite a lot of time uh, from a QSS perspective. I think it also improves the value discussion. Something we are looking to implement more frequently are cost reviews based on the current design uh, as, as, we, as the design develops. So that would be in conjunction with our key milestone cost updates, which you are more akin to a standard process. 
The importance of the little and often approach is that we can identify if an area of a project is going over budget before design is complete or, if, or when, before planning is submitted without having an opportunity to review these alternative ideas. So the QA should now be able to focus on, uh, have more time with the client and client team and improving that best value of the scheme rather than just reporting on an outcome. So if, if BIM helps improve standardization, then also we can look at the extraction of cost data becoming far simpler. The function of extracting project data into a wider cost database should be seen as an essential output of a 5D QS. The ability to benchmark your project costs quickly and accurately is an essential role a QS can form with the help of a good BIM process. BIM also does not mean there is no longer any project risk. I think sometimes there's a sort of misnomer there, but it can mean risks are identified quicker and can need to be managed to an acceptable level or worked through to arrive at a different solution. So already there's a, there's a whole suite of things that QS can now do better, quicker, and more efficiently for the client and the client team. Great. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, I'll throw it over to James Brown. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm not sure if you'll uh, agree with what I'm about to say or not. Um, <laughs> but I think, historically, I think I've heard a lot of um, sort of comments that it's going to reduce you know, the scope of what QSs do and the length of time it's going to take them to, to model, sorry, to, to, no, to cost model and be able to take quantities off of, uh, off of designs. I'm not sure if that's necessarily where um, the greatest benefit is, is going to come from. I think the ability for the QS to, to quantify risk more effectively is, is a, a massive benefit. Um, I think sort of my experience of working um, in the retail sector has shown that as, as we have um, costed projects uh, more accurately, it kind of takes away a lot of um, ambiguity of it, or sort of it takes away the ability for, for cost to be hidden in packages because you can physically see um, where, the, where those costs are going. And when you start to break it down into um, you know, the, the, the elements in individual parts, you can start to see where previously people have hidden their costs and, and their risk into that. So I think it takes a lot of that away. I think um, during the design process when uh, designers are making changes, if you've got the templates set up accurately, I think the, the, the speed of making those design changes within, within the cost plan will um, uh, become a lot faster. And I also think that it gives the QS the opportunity to take more control of the projects um, that I think traditionally they've potentially lost that. Thank you, James. Um, OK, so what prevents the quantity surveyor from undertaking their role as a 5D quantity surveyor? Who'd like to start us off? Yeah, I could. Uh, uh, Robert. <laughs> yeah, I, I've. It's interesting. I'll uh, I'll refer to uh, um, a BIM for SME team uh, exercise to do um, building Newcastle Live, um, where at that point I was using a different uh, software platform uh, to all of the other people, um, and also the um, quantities there on the job. Um, and uh, suggested that we exchange files with IFC um, in that situation. To begin with, um, everybody was very nervous about not using the same software platform, um, and, uh, and the QS, which was Andrew in this instance, um, was nervous about receiving a file format he hadn't got before and had, had, had actually had bad experience of. Um, what it came down to, um, and the reason that it worked, was because we took the time um, as uh, the designers in that instance to um, uh, to uh, classify elements in the model, number elements in the model, and uh, those as as absolute sort of base um, uh, activities made our data data usable by an, um, by the quantity surveyor. This is the same, I and mean, the interesting thing was we were being pushed down a route to use a package we were unfamiliar with. Um, but if we'd produced a model that had limited information in it um, in, uh, in any software package, regardless of whether it was an IFC file format as a deliverable, um, the result was going to be the same. The QS couldn't do anything with it. Um, and it comes back very much to what uh, James Cameron said um, a moment ago. Um, if the data isn't in the model, then that immediately is an obstacle um, to the QS um, actually using um, the, uh, the, the model to, um, to come up with anything meaningful um, because you need to be able to refer to an element if you're going to cost it and then refer to it when it changes. Okay, thanks. Uh, Andrew. Hi, well, for me it's quite simple. I think just not engaging with the process, that's what seems to be preventing the QS to me. Um, I <laughs> would see that most QS practices will have projects in their office where a designer has used a 3D model, but they might not necessarily be aware that that is the case. So although this might not necessarily be BIM, 
I would urge everyone to explore with their supply chain what is available and start to get involved and understand how you can work together. The place for a QS to start is with working out what data they want and in what format, how they can extract the information from the data sources provided. It's as simple as that. Have the conversation, get involved. I think also, as we've already seen earlier on, bad models, or perhaps more importantly, bad data. Simple issues such as naming conventions, uh, well-organized data make a big difference. If this is not followed, then the QS job become more time-consuming and not more efficient, and that's you know a r bad news for us, basically. Mm. Okay, great stuff. Um, moving on, should a quantity surveyor see BIM as an opportunity or a threat? <laughs> uh, Robert. <laughs> I'll use this as an opportunity to, I've been plugging this one for years, but uh, if you Google uh, nobody wants my quantities, uh, you'll uh, come across a blog I wrote in 2008, I think, or maybe even 2006, um, which uh, records my experience of trying to get QSs to engage with, uh, um, with uh, BIM. The point um, that I make in that, which I think is very salient in this instance, is that BIM... Um, for all the disciplines, the QS included, the automation um, uh, that is embodied in BIM um, and the processes that uh, work with, uh, with the models um, uh, frees up time to do stuff which is more valuable. Um, I've always uh, said, and I think I say in that uh, piece, that I think quantity surveyors should think of themselves as, um, as cost consultants, not quantity surveyors, because the actual surveying of quantities is not very valuable to a client, whereas um, having a handle on cost and risk in a project is extremely valuable. Uh, so I don't see it as a threat at all. Thank you, Robert. Anyone want to come in? Uh, Andrew? Yeah, well, I was going to say both. Uh, firstly, by not getting involved is going to be bad for you as an individual and, and your company. I think BIM is a vehicle for change, how we can manage project delivery and how we can collect and use data. So failure to get involved could have a negative impact on your business competitiveness, as, as we see it. But the opportunities for us outweigh the threats. So improving your ways of working, being able to offer improved and new services should be greeted with open arms, and we need to embrace the change. So, you know, a bit of a hobby horse for me, but I think we need to sort of look forward and embrace what's coming. Thank you. Uh, James Cameron? Yes, I think this. I'm just going to make the point over, over the uh, overarching point about this, which is that um, engaging in BIM is not the absolute panacea to the QS's role. What it'll allow you to do, and, uh, and Robert was starting to, to allude to this, is that it'll, it, rather than doing the manual tasks, uh, you're taking a, a baseline of, of automated information from a model, but then applying your professional skill over the top of it. So the point here is that. Uh, BIM is enabling your process, it's giving you uh, additional um, value added, uh, and that, that in itself will take you into, into possibly a slightly different chapter, um, uh, and I throw this one out there for, for thinking about um, certainly some of the uh, newly qualified people coming into, into the QS world, that um, they will be able to use um, the information from, from the, uh, the, the BIM model itself, um, but they, and they'll be very proficient at that, but they might not actually have got the experience in terms of the, the analog understanding of how construction occurs. And, the, the, and I think that that's something that the industry will need to be watching uh, and commenting on to make sure that the, the, the younger people coming through have that correct understanding of, of construction. Thank you. And Jim Brown is on. Thank you. It's a, it feels like a bit of a, a funny if, funny question in, in that it kind of suggests there's a um, a choice in, in sort of making the decision as to whether or not you do it or you don't. I think not just with, with uh, QSing, but I think the whole of the industry, it, it's something that if you don't do, you will, um, you will no longer be sort of, well, you know, you won't be relevant in, in, in building infrastructure going forward. So, you know, whether, whether the government made it, man, you know, whether they stick to their mandate or not, I think they will do, but if whether they do or they don't, that's the direction that the industry is going in. So, you know, whether you see it as a threat or an opportunity, if you choose not to do it, I think it will put you in a position where you're, you're not going to be relevant in, in a year or so's time. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, how should a project manager upskill themselves to get involved with BIM? Who'd like to say that? Andrew. Okay, well, I think the first thing is don't assume it's all technology and actually start to understand the processes and standards. From here, a PM will quickly see that the BIM, uh, the BIM sorry, is, does not just mean 3D models, but actually an opportunity to better manage the delivery of construction projects from design through to asset management, and that a project manager could and should be at the heart of this. Their ability to lead a team is invaluable, and so adding 
in the standards that BIM can bring will improve the cohesion within the team and result in better outputs. A PM should also consider communication tools. There are many great ways to communicate as a team and effective communication is all part of a process change to achieve better outcomes. On the, recent, on the recent ASIC competition, we identified seven successful ways we communicated with each other and to a wider audience. This has been illustrated in a recent blog by Rob Garvey. Also, working smarter, quicker, and generally more efficient has got to be a benefit to any project team. And there are various systems that can help with this. Identifying what systems can, uh, can do and if they can save time and or if effort or energy, and if energy is well spent. We have recently introduced a new form into our ways of working and have found benefit in their site apps that enable us to capture data and report it to a wider project team in a professional and expedient way. Processes and managing data this way, including using shared drives with the project team, is all part of a new smarter process that BIM encourages. And for us, that is again just part of the journey that we're going on to improve our ways of working. James. Um, I'm going to try and answer the question in a slightly different way to say that um, how, how do you upskill yourself. Um, obviously, there are a number of open and, and online training uh, opportunities that, that are available. And uh, just to name the RSCS, there's the BIM Manager Certification, which uh, was launched sort of 18 months to 24 months ago, which would be very worthwhile. And I'm sure the RABA do, do an equivalent course on that. But um, my, my sort of overarching thought on this is Project managers, QSs, and the design teams should realize that, that BIM is integral to uh, modern construction projects uh, rolling forward from now. And t talent uh, w within organizations will, will be seen as quite a, a, a key commodity. Um, and then if you, if, you, if you extrapolate that forward a few years, you, you, you'll be looking at um, the way organizations actually form. And do you actually then have uh, the future being sort of demountable organizations and you become a mobile uh, capital that, that uh, people within the industry will be able to go and work on lots of different projects and take, take that knowledge with them. Um, but the, uh, the, there's definitely a, a push and I would uh, promote uh, lifelong learning um, for, for BIM being part of it. Great, thank you very much. Um, last couple of discussion questions and then we'll try and fit in a couple of Q&A. Uh, questions, uh, what is the difference between a project manager and an information manager? Uh, James Brown. Thank you. That's a very good question. I think um, what we're looking at at the moment is uh, a level of maturity within the industry where the, the role of the, the coordination, which um, I think is uh, well, sort of the, the, the management of the technical side of, of BEM, is, is currently sat with, it, with an information manager because other disciplines within the supply chain, within that project team, don't necessarily have the skill set and the capability to do it um, themselves. I think if you were to fast forward maybe two or three years, maybe four or five years, where the capability, you know, the, the skills and the roles that are undertaken by the information manager will start to fit into other disciplines. So I think you will see, and I'll probably, this is probably something Andrew will um, have a view on, um, you know, I, I very much see that at some point in the very near future that that information manager role will um, dissolve and it will get incorporated into the right role um, for that for that team. And I suspect actually that the project manager um, will be the person that takes that uh, that role on going forward. I think there are stages um, throughout the construction process where that um, role would be better suited to another role. I think um, when you start to look at design reviews and coordinations, um, you know a lot of those roles I think would be better suited to a QSing role. Thank you very much. Anyone else for that, or should we go to Andrew? So uh, what are the differences? Well, I'd say at the moment quite a lot. <laughs> An informa information manager is someone who's heavily involved with the BIM process, and for me, it seems the PM is possibly not. So there's a, there's a clear divide already. But as we've seen already, a PM can have an active role within a BIM project, and it would be to their and their client's advantage, I think, if they could undertake the role of the information manager, as many clients are reluctant to engage with an even greater number of the, uh, or, or a wider design team. So they're likely to be looking forward to, or to their design team to get one of their incumbents to take that role on. The function in PAS 1192.2 states that the role does not carry any design responsibility. So for, so for me, this opens an opportunity up to a non-designer to undertake this role. Of course, enabling information exchange is key. So there's an area of upskilling required, but this should not be beyond the means of a PM to do so. Thank you. Um, James Cameron. 
Um, speaking from an architectural uh, background, uh, I would say that the it, the best placed person in, in this to be the information manager is probably the design team leader, which typically is the architect if you're looking at that, that role. Um, I think they're best placed certainly through feasibility and planning, and as that project transfers into delivery, the main contractor uh, is best placed to have a member of his team, and that could be an internal member or indeed an external member. He can go out to, to, to any, any of the other design team members, but the ownership and the responsibility transfers as the project matures. Uh, Robert. <laughs> yes. I'll just, uh, I, all I wanted to add to that was uh, you can see from the three answers that we've had um, that there is some competition for this role, and I think that that's going to continue. Um, in my opinion, it's healthy. Um, uh, it's uh, as a designer or former designer, um, I sometimes find it rather frustrating the suggestion that designers shouldn't be information managers, um, especially as uh, contractors seem to hire so many architects as design managers to uh, to run projects. Um, but uh, it, it, I think the the headline of that is that you need to consider it on a project by project basis in many instances. Um, sometimes uh, um, it may be uh, that it's a uh, one of the other engineering disciplines who's uh, most appropriate to be the information manager. Um, but uh, and, and inevitably um, in, in a very small number of cases it might be quantitative uh, tongue-in-cheek. <laughs> Thank you Robert. Um, Okay, final discussion question. Please keep your answers uh, brief. Is it hard for SME quantity surveyors or project managers to get involved with BIM and where can they turn for help? Who'd like to say that? Andrew. Uh, possibly it could be hard, but I think we've all talked previously about the fact that if you're an SME, you've got the ability to move quickly. Um, but it's where do you move and, and you know who do you turn to? There may seem like a lack of guidance on how to implement BIM, uh, but help is at hand. So for those that don't know, there are BIM regions that cover the length and breadth of the country that can be used as a source uh, for help and information. But there are also the BIM4, such as BIM for SME that Robert and I are involved with, and they focus on the implementation of BIM right across the SME sector. So there is out ha free help out there that you can all get in contact with. There are also other BIM4s that focus on more specific areas, such as BIM for fit out and BIM for retail. Uh, and these are a great starting point to learn more about uh, BIM and without the pressure of expedient, uh, expending sorry, excessive money on CPD or software. So there is free help out there and guidance that people are willing to give. So please turn to those sources. Uh, Robert. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the issue that SMEs have with BIM, um, there, are, there are good things and there are bad things, um, similar to, um, to bigger, bigger practices. Um, but the, uh, the good things is that they're uh, versatile. They can make decisions very quickly. The bad thing is that they, uh, they um, don't have much in the way of resources. Um, what SMEs are really reliant on is finding um, the right clients to work with. And I was uh, just saying in a meeting yesterday that um, one of the most useful characteristics that I've developed uh, over time with BIM is to know when I'm speaking to somebody who isn't a convert um, and give up as quickly as possible. <laughs> Find the right people um, because... Uh, um, if you're talking to the right person, you very quickly see that they um, understand what you're saying and often you'll find a bigger company will invest in your ideas because you're capable of delivering, delivering them faster. Okay, James, see you want to have a quick word? Um, yes, I was just going to come in and say that just, just remember everybody that, that BIM is about process and defined ways of working. So um, small SMEs uh, can engage with that. And, and get their get their foot in the door initially, um, because this will lead to you being leaner as an op uh, as an organisation, which will make you more competitive, uh, and then it will make your projects run more smoothly. Um, collaboration is key, uh, and, and one one other uh, area that I, a couple of areas I would push actually is obviously the BIM Task Group, um, BIMTaskGroup.org as, as the government website. That, that that is probably the best place to go in terms of getting a very broad spectrum for. Uh, what is BIM? How, how can you develop it, and how can you take it forward? Um, and then uh, R Robert doesn't know this, but I think uh, what I'm about to say. But uh, also, there are some good uh, books and uh, articles out there. And, and one of Rob's the key one is uh, BIM, BIM in, in the small practice, which I think is worth promoting. Um, and also Richard Saxon with uh, Grace Through BIM, the report that you wrote. Great, thank you. Right, we've got time for just maybe one or two quick questions. Uh, we've got one here from Claire Cartwright. Um, she asks, do you think saving a fifth of the project's budget is an achievable target? Who'd like to say that? 
So I'll uh, uh, let Robert. me um, respond by saying, um, because everybody thinks that this means that our fees are going to be reduced by a fifth, which they probably will be sooner or later by, um, uh, because that's, that's the way that clients go. But actually, if you read what this sentence is really referring to, it is a saving um, by the avoidance of waste. Um, and uh, and the design is a really good way of avoiding waste. Um, so don't uh, don't think that it's just about cutting fees. It's about making the overall project cost uh, cheaper. You know we're always going to be looking for lean processes, um, but it's not about um, about uh, just cutting fees, cutting design time, cutting planning time for main contractors, um, because uh, you know we all know that. Um, well-planned and designed buildings um, run more cheaply. Anyone else? Uh, James yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm just going to jump in and say it obviously depends on the, the scale and the nature of the project. If, you're, if, you, if you are the MOJ and you're doing Crook and Wood, yes, you, you can probably make a very significant saving with a one-off project. If you're engaged by a commercial client or a commercial organization who has a pretty honed uh, cost plan and delivery process, uh, you will find that more difficult to achieve the 20%. Um, it, it's, it is achievable. It's out there. Um, so certainly, the, there are ways to do that. And as, as, as Robert said, it's about efficiency. Um, so don't give up. It is out there. Robert? Uh, it, uh, uh, what James has said um, reminds me of something that uh, I've said in a number of, um, of lectures that I've given on um, BIM in your business. Um, and that is, uh, and I think